the um, the announcement itself happens, it occurs, and that can be a market mover. Um, what we're looking for is a change in the language. Remember, uh, the United States economy uh, was kind of slow in the first half due to bad weather, and we want them to take out that language because they talked about it, uh, when was it, April? So they need to take that out, and that would probably warm the market up to a September um, rate hike. That's the thought anyways, because people expect it. So any positive change in, in, the, in their language would hint towards that. And that's what the Fed really wants to do. I mean, transparency, right? So they're not going to raise interest rates today because they, um, they haven't prepared the market for it. So anyways, let, let's get going. And um, I thought maybe I could um, talk a little bit about the FOMC. Is anyone kind of fuzzy on the Federal Open Market Committee? Cool. Well, then uh, you're in the right place, yo. Let's get going. Let me remind you that trading and investing is risky and not appropriate for everyone. However, your past performance, good or bad, is not indicative of future results. So stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. My name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for Traders. Wayne, thank you for being at this webinar. Good to have you. This is a special event. We're covering the Federal Open Market Committee's interest rate decision and press conference by the chairman of the Board of Governors and the chair, or sorry, chairperson of the Board of Governors, who is also the chairperson of the Federal Open Market Committee, and that is Janet Yellen. So we're going to get our statement. We're going to look for a change in the statement. It, and it should be a hint if the Fed's going to raise in September or December, we should get the hint today. We don't get the hint. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Um, not this year, I would imagine. So, it could be a shock one way or the other. So, um, let's talk about it. Um, when the Fed was created in, uh, well, why was the Fed created? See, we had, a, uh, we tried to create a couple of central banks early in the, uh, you know, pre-Civil War. But you have to understand how the United States was created. They hated the, the King of England. That's how the Americans got here. <laughs> they hated the King of England. So the Americans have always, always had a, a distrust of uh, central power. And um, whether it's banking or government, it doesn't matter. It's very anti-American. Just, uh, you know, the much, much, much distrust going back forever. It's just in the soul of an American. So... Uh, people were against it. We tried a couple of times. We didn't try that well, and it failed. It was kind of doomed from the beginning, and it was half-hearted attempts to have a central bank. But you know what? Sweden had a central bank. England had a central bank, <laughs> but not the United States. Um, but whatever. Okay. Oh man, I got taken out. Go. Oh. Okay. Um, so the United States went for a very long time after the the second. Um, attempt of a central bank, we went for like 20 or 30 years of having no central bank whatsoever, which was fine, except we had a million banks and each one of them was issuing their own currencies and, and, and the, you know, when there were liquidity problems, there was no lender of last resort because there was no central bank. And so, uh, you know, just counterfeit was rampant and um, bank runs were rampant. Because uh, because of the nature of the fractional reserve banking system, if everybody showed at the same time to ask for the money, there wasn't actually enough money to give the deposits, the whole thing would crash, right? Let's go back to here. Keep an eye on the time for me, huh? One minute, hang on. So, in 1907, there was a terrible run on banks. Oh, here we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
FOC, FOC holds rate as expected, again holding rate as expected. Forecasting 2015 GDP of 1.8 percent to 2 percent, previously saw 2.3 to 2.7, so lowering for this year, next year sees 1.8 to 2 percent. Inflation continues to run below target. It says energy prices appear to have stabilized. Vote is 10 to nothing with no dissenters. The Fed emphasizing inflation continues to run below target and energy prices have stabilized. That's his economic activity expanding moderately. Pace of job gains has picked up. So upgrading the economic language as expected. Fed is also lowering their long-run jobless rate to 5% from 5.2% to 5.2%. GDP growth seen at 2% to 2.3%. That's in line previously. Fed officials forecasting slightly slower pace of future interest rate hikes in the dot charts. This is Trade the News. This is TradeTheNews.com, by the way. Look at this. Look at the whipsaws, huh? Glad I'm out. In fact, projecting core inflation 1.3 to 1.4 percent this year, 1.6 to 1.9 percent next year, and 1.9 to 2 percent in 2017. And just to recap, the longer term unemployment projection is unchanged at 5 to 5.2 percent. In terms of median funds rate, median funds rate seen at 1.625 at the end of next year and 2.875 percent at the end of 2017. Wow, people are getting white clean, huh? So slightly here, following the Fed release, we're back into positive territory. Bond markets in the FX seeing a little bit of volatility, but now seeing the dollar trade a little bit lower. The dollar yen 123.87 and the euro 112.87. So slight weakness here in the dollar following the FOMC statement. Okay, so it's the press conference that's going to matter now. Just looking at some other news here, and then I'll continue updating you before the press conference about the, what the Federal Open Market Committee is. Just watching it. Okay, central weekly central pivot point on that USD yen. Wow, look at that pig dog go. Holy smokes. So looks like the market says no rate hike in September. So they must be thinking December now, kick it down the road. Inflation continues to run below target is probably the one that people are moving at. And this idea of less than 2%, why would you raise interest rates if inflation is less than 2%, right? All right, so 1907, there was tons and tons and tons. Of, in fact, thousands of bank runs occurred in 1907 in the United States. Thousand. Because what happens is uh, a bank fails, everybody loses their money. So based on that uh, that occurrence, there's rumors that other banks would be in trouble. So what do you do if you could potentially lose all your life savings because your bank fails? Because, uh, because another bank failed. So what, what do people tend to do? Yeah, they get out. They absolutely get out. So even though their bank might be healthy, 
you know, all of a sudden there's a line around the bank. Everyone wants to get their money out because there's not enough to money. Most of the money has been lent out to mortgages and, and small business loans. There's no cash. So all of a sudden you go up and you're like, give me all my money. And they give you enough. They have enough to cover you. And the next guy says, give me all my money. And there's enough to cover him. And then the third guy in line, he says, give me all my money. He's like, dude, we're out of money. Sorry, the bank's closed. And just like that, the bank's insolvent. There's no central bank. There's no lender of last resort. See, they have a liquidity problem. They have pr good loans that are performing on the, on the books. Their assets on the books. But they don't have enough deposits, right? So they're short on cash. They're, they're long on, on, um, on, on, on loans. So pff, all of a sudden, there's nowhere else. You, they can't really borrow the money because they could possibly go... See, if, you're, if you had a central bank, you'd go to the central bank and say, hey, central bank, I got this liquidity problem. People are asking for their cash. I don't really have enough cash on hand. I, I've loaned it out to small businesses and, and, and to mortgages in my community. So uh, can, I, can I use my, my, uh, my, my good loans as collateral? And they're like, yeah, sure, not a problem, right? But there's no central bank. So boom, bank goes out of business. Everybody loses their money because they're insolvent. So... All of a sudden, every bank in America had a line outside of, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people lined up outside their banks. Give me all my money. And basically, the entire banking system collapsed in 1907. Guess who bailed them out? It wasn't the government. Yeah, it was J.P. Morgan, not the bank, the dude. <laughs> Mr. Morgan. Ah, call him J.P. Right, yeah, Mr. J.P. Morgan. Holy smokes. He saved the entire economy. So anyways, he says, this sucks. I don't want to keep bailing the economy out, because it actually, these bank runs... And um, occurred quite often, like every every ten or twelve years, there was a a, a, a minor um, bust. Well, this one in 1907 was just pandemic, right? Just it just spread like like a disease through the banking system, and every just a, you know whole thing basically collapsed. So J.P. Morgan comes along. He's he's the only guy wealthy enough. Just remember, this was before uh, federal income taxes. He was he was wealthy enough to uh, own uh, to to be able to bail everyone out because remember before um, before income taxes you got to keep all your money so you're fabulously wealthy but also there wasn't a you know a, a major uh, equities market and stuff like that so if you were going to raise money you'd go to a rich family and say hey Mr J P Morgan will you will you invest some money in my company he's like okay I'll buy eighty percent of the shares. <laughs> so be just everything, right? Anyway, so he bails it out, and then he says, "This sucks because I don't want to have to bail out the economy every ten years, right?" He says, "Well, we're finally ready for a new for a central bank." So he gets all his uh, his Wall Street buddies together, and they meet together at their at his hunting lodge to smoke cigars and drink brandy. It was actually bourbon because they were in Georgia, Jekyll Island, Georgia, and they're smoking their cigars, and they're like, "Hey." You know what, dudes, I don't want to have to bail out the United States again, man. That was close. I had to put all my money on the line, save the entire nation, bail out the government, basically, right? It's like, I don't want to have to do this. This, this is a liability to me. I don't want that. They said, all right, so let's put together, um, let's put together a, um, uh, a central bank. So they start doing some basic framework, then they... They decide um, they need to call some buddies. So they had a, a phone line built from New York City to Jekyll Island, Georgia. By the way, Jekyll Island, Georgia is still in the middle of nowhere. But there was actually a line, a telephone line, all the way from Washington, D.C., or no, from uh, New York City to Jekyll Island, Georgia. It was like the first uh, long-distance you know, phone line of more than 1,000 miles or something strange like that. But anyways... Um, and so they start calling all their banking buddies. What do you need? What do you need? Then uh, some more time goes by. Let's say they meet again a, a year later. 
And now they need to get the, uh, the politicians involved in this framework because they realized they're never going to get this passed. Just People just still didn't trust a central bank. So they, so they had a, a phone line built from Washington, D.C. to Jekyll Island, Georgia. No joke. It's incredible. This is 1907, 1908. But that's the kind of money you got, right? I'll just build a phone company. So anyway, so they... So now they got a phone line directly to Wall Street, and they got a, uh, the, a phone line directly to uh, Washington, D.C. And they call up their buddy, President Wilson. They're like, yeah, we're going to need to push this through. Um, and he says, yeah, well, I got some senators that are going to be against this, and especially uh, Missouri and all that kind of stuff. And so if you look, uh, Missouri actually has two Fed offices. The, it, the districts are split through the state. But there's actually two offices in Missouri. Why? Because they had powerful politicians. So anyways, they get together and they finally put this framework together that they think they can get passed politically so that they can basically bail out J.P. Morgan from his liability of the entire global economy. So they decide, well, we're going to need, uh, we're going to need Washington influence. Because that's what the politicians are going to want. They're going to want control. All right, so we're going to have a board of governors. We're going to make a chairman. Fine. And then there's going to be six others. And the seven of them will be the board of governors. But we, can, we don't want any influence here because we'll never get San Francisco to vote for this. We'll never get Chicago to vote for this. Just forget about Missouri and, um, and Texas. We, they're so scared that we're going to basically load um, load the deck in our favor, you know, the Washington, D.C. guys and, and the, and the uh, Wall Street guys are going to run the whole thing, right? I mean, that's, that's the distrust. That if you're a farmer in Iowa, these guys in Washington and New York City, are, they're going to screw you over. And forget about California, right? So, um, so they said, well, the way we're going to have to do it is these board of governors, they're going to have to have each come from a different region. So there's seven people on the board of governors, and none of them are from the same district. They're all from completely different districts. And they said, wow, that's going to be tough to manage. So why don't we, instead of having a central bank, why don't we just put a whole bunch of central banks all across the United States? Board of Governors will be kind of like the Washington, D.C., you know, oversight guys. But really, we're going to have to put branches all across the United States in all the major cities. And you know what? They won't just be branches. They will actually be central banks. So they get this crazy idea. No one's going to want one central bank, so why don't we have like 12 central banks? All independent of each other. The Board of Governors will just be split from people from all over the, in the United States. They'll all be economists, so they'll, they'll know macroeconomics, and they'll, they'll have some insight, like one person might be from Detroit, another person might be from Dallas, and, uh, and another one might be from Des Moines, you know. But... Okay, so that's good. This is starting to work out, they felt, right? We could probably get this thing passed. So we'll use each of these regional banks to um, gather statistics about how the economy is doing, and then they can report that to the, to the Board of Governors, and the Board of Governors can make, make appropriate changes macroly, not just micro, right? And they said, oh, okay, but... That's statistics are only backward looking. We're going to need like forward looking stuff, right? So why don't we actually have each of those re the presidents of the regional banks meet with the business leaders, gather their their business outlooks, what 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 the business leaders think the economy is going to be like over the next six to twelve months? And they're like, yeah, this is starting to feel good. All right, so who are we going to put in charge of these regional banks? Well, we're going to need bankers. We don't need economists. We need bankers because they need to understand the fractional reserve banking system. All right, so let's do it this way. Let's get three bankers from each region. So in San Francisco, they'll have three bankers working at the San Francisco Fed. Good. Okay, great. What else are we going to need? Well, it can't just be bankers. We're going to need business people. 
because they're going to have connections to the people we need to talk to to get the the outlook stuff right all right let's get three business people from every bank great and then what So now what are we going to do? Well, we got business, we got bankers. Why don't we just throw in some academics and some nonprofit people or something, yada, yada, yada. Okay, fine. So they throw in three more. Now they got nine of them. And they elect a president. And all these, right? And now you got the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And... Um, what they do is they hold the deposits like a central bank for all the local banks throughout the the San Francisco Fed region, which goes all the way to Seattle and all the way down to Mexico. Right? So those banks are going to have deposits, and they're not going to trust us either. So why don't we make them um, shareholders of the of the corporation? And they'll buy into the shares, and they'll actually be, be shares, and they'll, they'll be the ones electing all these directors. Fantastic. Good. We can probably get that passed. So the member banks own the, the central bank, and eat, their central banks located all through the United States, and they're, they're comprised of directors that are bankers and business leaders and academics. Base representation and then each one of them, maybe once their presidents are ready to retire, we'll send them to the Board of Governors, and that's good. So who are we going to pick the Board of Governors? Well, you know, this, we need Washington, D.C. to do that, so it'll be appointed by the President of the United States. Ah, but what if the President loads the, loads the deck again? We have to prevent that. So every, every time the President of the United States appoints a governor for the Board of Governors, Um, that'll have to be approved by the Senate. So the President of the United States will say, I, I nominate this person, it goes to the Senate, the Senate rakes them through a, a hotbed of coals, and they either approve or deny. That sounds pretty good. Now we got our, our system. So what does, uh, how does the Federal Open Market Committee get involved? Well, what they do is they take some of the members of the, um, the regional banks and they take the members of the Board of Governors and they take the, um, the president of the New York Fed and they put them together and they form a committee and they decide what they should do on a national basis of whether they should be um, increasing the money supply or decreasing the money supply. And that's what Open Market Committee does. And if they want to increase, they buy bonds or other things like change the reserve requirements. But generally, it's the open market that we're talking about with the FOMC. So the FOMC decides, should we go in the open market and buy bonds and, and drive down interest rates? Or should we go into the open market and sell bonds and drive up interest rates? And that's what the Federal Open Market Committee does. Now, the president of the New York Fed is always there always at these meetings. And the reason for that is that's where the bonds are actually bought and sold, at the New York Fed, because that's where all the, the major Wall Street banks are and all the bond dealers are. So when the Fed says, we want the interest rates to be, you know, 1%, it's not law. It doesn't get passed by the President of the United States or Congress and approved by the President of the United States. No, 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 no. They go to the open market, just like you and me, and they... In this case, right now, interest rates are lower than 1%. So if the Fed says to, right now interest rates are 1%, they'll go to the open market. They'll sell bonds, drive down bond prices, and drive up interest rates. And that's what they do. And that's what they do. That's the Federal Open Market Committee. So how do they make that decision? Well, remember I said that each regional bank... They sit down with their business leaders and they grab forward-looking statistics, but they also gather economic forward-looking guidance, but they also gather economic statistics. Well, what they do is they take all that information, they bind it together in in uh, in a binder, and it's actually beige in color, 
and that's distributed to all the members of the Federal Open Market Committee and all the other ones that are non-voting that are there as well, and that's called the Beige Book. Beige Book is released. You can read that. Now, there's also like the, what is it, like the, the um, uh, General Office of, of Accounting or something like that. They also do an assessment, and that's given to the, um, to the FOMC, and that's called the Blue Book. That's not publicly released. And then the Board of Governors staff of econo uh, economists, by the way, they've they have more economists on staff than anyone else in the entire world. They also do an assessment of all the statistics, and um, that's given to the members as the Green Book. So there's a Green Book, a Blue Book, and a Beige Book. The Beige Book is the only one that's public. So they look at that, and that's what they did yesterday. They, they reviewed, well, first of all, the, um, the, the Board of Governors staff did their projections, PowerPoint presentation. And then the uh, General Office of Accounting, they did their uh, outlook. And then there were some discussions, but never a debate. And they never talk about monetary policy. They're just talking about the statistics now. And then today, what they're actually deciding uh, is what they should do um, in, for, as a federal open market committee, um, should they be, in this case, normalizing interest rates or not. And they'll debate based on the information available to them through the uh, blue book, the beige book, and the green book. They formulate the uh, statement. And then Janet Yellen is going to, because she's chairman of the FOMC, but also chairman of the Board of Governors, uh, she will be doing the one. Uh, she she will be the one doing the press conference and providing the transparency to the to the general public. And that's it. I think you can keep you, my phone keeps beeping. There's a, a micro emergency going on, so I, I'm going to stop the recording. And then uh, we'll listen to the um, speech together. How's that? Apologize for the interruption. <laughs>